I am John Travis in Mullumbimby, New South Wales on February 15th, 2020, and I'm with David Rakel, where it's Valentine's Day in Albuquerque. So uh, you had uh, a good Valentine's Day so far? Yeah, not too bad. Too, too many sweets, but that's okay once in a while. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just learned the term Galentine's yesterday, the, referring to females. <laughs> I don't know if that's caught on. Anyway, um, we met, what, 10 years ago at, at Jeff's place? Uh, um, Probably about 10 or 12, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you were doing things at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and uh, I learned about you and your work and have since seen you rise to greater fame and glory, and now you're down there in the warmer lands of uh, New Mexico. Yes. But you, do you miss the Wisconsin winters? Uh, I miss the snow. I, I don't miss the fact that it would never melt, but <laughs> I do miss a good snowfall. It's just the change of season. Sometimes you look out the window here and you say, damn, another sunny day. You want a little bit more variety. <laughs> you know? uh, but it's beautiful. The land of enchantment is right on. There's so much beauty. You just have to look up a little bit and uh, you see beautiful vistas and a beautiful sky. It's quite, quite uh, gorgeous. Yeah. How long have you been there? Three and a half years. Uh huh. Well, I'd like to uh, dig into who you are and why. Uh, <laughs> what you've done is is well documented, and there are links to that in the narrative. But uh, I'd like to start with where you were born, what your family origin was like, uh, what inf uh, inclinations uh, be to become a doctor, and that sort of thing. So, uh, let me start there. Sure. Yeah, I. Um... You know, when you think about white privilege, I'm a pretty good example. Yeah. And <laughs> we have a master's in domination degree after our name, too. <laughs> or medical deity, whichever. Uh, so, yeah, my father was a physician and my mother was a nurse. And, and so I, I grew up in a medical family. Um, my uh, father, I was born in Newport Beach, California, where my dad was in private practice. And then he started... Uh, the University of California, Irvine Family Medicine Department, which was one of the first departments yeah, uh, in was. family medicine. And we just returned this year from going and celebrating their 50th anniversary uh, wow. at UC Irvine. Uh, so that was exciting to do that. And he gave a talk and I made sure he didn't over, over, over talk. And <laughs> but it was fun <laughs> to go back to where I was born and uh, see uh, the program he started and then uh, I was going to be a geologist because I love nature and I love to learn from nature and I love to see how nature does it and and understand that if we go against those those laws of nature often we make mistakes uh, but the rocks wouldn't talk back and and I loved people <laughs> and uh, so I shifted uh, about my junior year in, in college to pre-med and uh, and then decided to enter medical school. And I got lucky and got accepted into Baylor College of Medicine down in Houston and uh, spent the next four years there and tried to go into other fields other than family medicine because that's kind of was in my genetics uh, <laughs> uh, based on what my father was interested in. Uh, and damn it, I loved everything. And I loved the complexity of the biopsychosocial spiritual aspect of every human being and it just seemed wrong focusing on parts uh yeah. so uh i wanted to learn about the the full forest that the trees live in and uh so uh i went into family medicine really focused on rural family medicine and picked a residency that uh trained rural docs uh, greeley colorado and uh, then after that, I went into rural practice and my wife and I opened up the Atlas and we said, where's a beautiful place that needs a doctor and everybody needs a family doctor. Uh, and there was this little town called Driggs, Idaho. There was only one burned out doctor with a 14 bed hospital. And I went and joined him. We had a great uh, nurse practitioner, a great physician's assistant, one psychologist. We had one of everything, one psychologist, one lab tech, uh, one hospital administrator. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there I learned the most because uh, we practiced womb to tomb medicine. I did everything from primary care to emergency medicine to surgical obstetrics. And uh, after about 
two or three years, it, it just felt wrong throwing a bunch of drugs at people because it being in a small town, you learn the stories, the context of human beings. And it just felt wrong throwing drugs at a story that helped you understand what was at the root of that symptom. And in fact, I quote you in my slideshow now of, uh, I was going to look up the exact words of, you listen to a patient until you figure out what drug to give. A, right. Remember that quote? Can you re recite it for us? Yeah, um, and this is true. I would. I was trained in a way that I would listen yeah. to a patient's story until I could attach a drug to their symptom. That was it. Attach and, a drug to their symptom. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd hear this complicated story and then, you know, they'd say, oh, I can't sleep. Okay, I got a drug for that. And, you know, that's really not a very efficient way to practice medicine. It's, it's very reductionistic and it doesn't really get us anywhere to yeah. a better place. So, uh, so then I, I started to read some books and one of those was Natural Healing by Andrew Weil. And Initially, I was a little pissed off at him because he was insulting my profession. You know, he was saying, <laughs> you know, traditional medicine is not doing it right. And, you know, initially I was somewhat defensive, but then I wanted to learn more about this concept. Uh, mainly what my patients were teaching me was that there was much more to this health and healing than this pill yeah. for every ill, find it, fix it model that, that I was trained in. Uh, so I applied for the fellowship. I was five years in rural practice and... I decided to uh, explore a fellowship and got accepted. So I picked up my wife and three kids and we moved to Arizona. And that was like a two year sabbatical. I mean, one, Andy Wow knows a lot of interesting people. And we yeah. got to meet a lot of interesting people in that process. And it was just so stimulating uh, to hear of different perspectives and different ways of, of seeing health and healing, different traditions, everything from Ayurveda to traditional Chinese medicine to homeopathy to uh, um, Native American healing. There were so many stimulating conversations of looking at how we can really shift our culture to really result in a healthier outcome for our populations, which we're not doing so well. Um, now, I've just got a curiosity. Were you there when Pam McDonald, a nurse practitioner who wrote the APOE gene book, uh, she was in that program about probably 10 years ago? I think she came after me. I was in the third class. It uh -huh. started in, in 97, and I got there in 99. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think she uh, came after me. Yeah. yeah. She was just back there for some kind of reunion. Were you there? Uh, couple weeks ago? Uh, no, that was uh, somewhere else. I was at Harvard taking a course for chairs of clinical departments of family medicine. Oh, uh, learn how to be an administrator? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know that old saying, if you're not at the table, you're out the menu. And the only way we can bring health and healing to the table is to uh, be at the table, right? I, we yeah. have to. So I think, you know, that's what I'm realizing here as I get further on in my career. You know, we, we, this can't be something outside of traditional medicine. It has to come from yeah. within. And, yeah. and, and then you have to be able to talk a similar language as, you know, a chair of internal medicine or a chair of pediatrics or yeah. neurosurgery. And uh, it's fun. It's exciting to, you know, uh, one of the things I learned at this conference was the definition of culture. And uh, they said, culture is how we do things around here. <laughs> which which I, I really like. Uh, and the way you change culture is that you have meaningful conversations with people and you create aha moments where your insight allows them to see light or things in a different light. And they let me see things in a different light. And slowly we change the culture towards where we want to go. So this course actually was looking at culture changing. Yeah, that was a part of it. That and strategy and healthcare finance. Uh -huh. <laughs> and yeah. it, was, it was very good, as you might expect. The faculty at Harvard are pretty talented. And, mm -hmm. and I came away with a lot of uh, new ideas. Well, I got a lot of questions in, in your uh, recent career, but I want to go back uh, just a little bit in your uh, uh, early days. Were you the uh, only sibling or birth order or oh. anything like that? Yeah, I was the youngest of four. I had three older sisters. Uh, wow. My oldest sister is a PhD nurse. She does a lot of research in uh, pain. Um, my second oldest sister has passed away, and my third sister lives in Arizona. And, and she, um, uh, uh, what's it called, a gemologist? She, 
They studies gems. gems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then where did you go to college? Our Colorado College is in Colorado Springs. It's a small liberal arts school. Uh -huh. uh, they, they have a special unique curricula where you take one course at a time for three and a half weeks and then you take a four day break. Uh, and it, it fit my personality well because my wife bug, uh, teases me that when I sit down, I'll eat my green beans and then I'll eat my <laughs> salad and then I'll eat. <laughs> so <laughs> I like to focus on one thing and then finish it and move on. And, and so that, that course was, was no perfect. No there, of course. What's that? No OCD in there, of course. No, no, maybe just a little, just enough to get through medical school. That's what we well, said. My brother, the airline pilot, and all the professional air, airline pilots I know are OCD, and I think it's a really good trait. Yeah, to as it's been. Like airline pilots. But uh, uh, then um, it's interesting because Baylor was my first choice, but there was a screw up with the application. They sent me back the second half of the application, but they sent it to my college address over the summer and I never got it. So oh. I wound up going to Boston. But when I went, was in Houston, once I went over to the campus and walked around because DeBakey was just, I think he had just done his thing. And it was like they were into electronics, which I was into, and it was very appealing. And so I go to Boston where Freud still goes to the cocktail parties. And <laughs> so I got a dose of that and then I fled to California. But so uh, you did your internship and residency uh, where, and that was- In the, Greeley, Colorado. North Greeley. Colorado yeah. Medical Center. Yeah, in Greeley. And uh, are the stockyards still, uh, were they yeah. still? Still smelly. Every time it rains, you get uh, that aroma. <laughs> My co-author was from Greeley, and when we'd work on the wellness workbook in Greeley, it was like, ah. Yeah, exactly. Maybe they cleaned it up. So uh, then you, then when did you wind up in uh, Wisconsin and you met Jeff and? Yeah, uh, so um, after finishing the Integrative Medicine Fellowship in Tucson, I wanted to start a integrative medicine program at a university. Uh, so I pretty much cold called or cold lettered, if that's a thing. I wrote letters to uh, universities and I got job offers at three, uh, University of Michigan, University of Colorado, and University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much narrowed it down to University of Wisconsin and University of Colorado and it was, uh, uh, it was pretty much a coin flip. Although I did a little guided imagery session with a buddy of mine named Craig Schneider and, um, uh, and there's a lot of different techniques you can do with guided imagery, but one was a, a wisdom figure uh, that you ask a question of someone uh -huh. who cares for you, knows you well, and has your best interest at heart. And my wisdom figure uh, was a golden eagle. And in this image, the golden eagle came and picked me up and we went flying. And I looked down and there was oak trees and lakes. So we went to Wisconsin. <laughs> but that was, yeah, it was kind of a fun uh, process that we use therapeutically guided imagery to to help make decisions which was a difficult decision because we loved both opportunities but yeah uh, Wisconsin now, turned out. yeah when did you meet your wife and uh, let's talk a little about your family before we get into the professional angle yeah uh, I met my wife in college at Colorado College and um, uh, that was boy sophomore to junior year uh, and then we started dating and we got married in medical school and our first son came a little sooner than we expected. And so we uh, had him a uh, second year of medical school. And, uh, and then our daughter came along towards the end of medical school. And then our third son, Lucas, so I have uh, oldest son, Justin, he's now 31. Sarah, she's married, she's 28, 27. Well, you're older than you look then. <laughs> 55. Thank you. Uh, uh, and then Lucas, he's 24, and he just graduated from college uh, and is working at the University of Wisconsin. So we uh -huh. have three kids. Yeah. Uh, what college was he at? Uh, at? At University of Wisconsin in La Crosse. Oh, and okay. then my other two went to University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh huh. Uh, I know the uh, Stevens Point. Uh, campus the best because we used to have these wonderful wellness conferences. There. I remember. You mean, yeah. yeah. Have you been to one of them or? I never was, but I heard about them a lot. That was, yeah. Those were really popular right before I finished my fellowship. And I, I remember hearing about the big wellness convention at Stevens Point. 
It was like summer camp for adults. It was fantastic. And then they went and moved it to Minneapolis and hotels. It's lost all that wonderful uh, camaraderie. Yeah. So um, now, uh, what, did you create a department when you went there? Were you attached? Oh, yeah. To um, so I wrote a letter and I said, hey, I want to start this integrated medicine program. And at the time, you know, the universities weren't interested in this. The only reason they were interested in this was because the public was interested in it. Yeah, yeah. And the right. public got right. interested in it. Yeah, and, and complementary and alternative medicine. So uh, we called them guillotine clinics at the time uh, in that, you know, the, the university or the academic health center would create this integrative medicine or CAM clinic out in the periphery. And then when it didn't make money and they never made money, they would drop the guillotine and cut their losses. Uh -huh. So... So when I went to Wisconsin, I said, all right, we can't let that happen to us. So the best way to avoid being cut off is to truly integrate within the system. So yeah. a lot of the strategy was how do we help the oncologists help their patients get through chemotherapy better with hypnosis yeah. and acupuncture and, and some of these other tools. And then we helped uh, with some of the pain challenges that we see in primary care with integrative medicine. So we really infiltrated into the university in a way that uh, was able to talk a common language of science where we were able to talk the science of whatever it is an ap acupuncture and herb st john's wort and and then that says oh that person knows how to evaluate science and and that's the bridge that that allows trust mm -hmm. uh, and understanding so i spent a number of a lot of time in the first few years just going and giving grand rounds to all the different departments uh, to let them know of our services, but also to say, hey, you know, let's have these conversations on things your patients are using, but you weren't trained in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then that led to a textbook that I did for mainly geared towards primary care doctors to share the evidence in the field to uh, well, What was the them. year on your, your first edition? I started that in 2000, and I think the first one was published in 01, 2001. Uh, we're working on the fifth edition now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you do that single-handedly, or do you have a team, or what's... Uh, well, Elsevier's a publisher, and for the first four editions, I did it single-handedly, which is a, it's a great way to get to know people, right? Uh -huh. uh, you know, the worst thing when you're editing a text is that you know, you have someone agree to write on a chapter and then they bug out in the last month and you're stuck. Yeah. <laughs> so that relationship with people is so important because they're less likely to bug out if they know and trust you. Uh, and, you know, with demands with life, my plate's gotten more full. So I have uh, just invited an associate editor on for the fifth edition. That sounds smart. I did one a uh, book like that with 50 authors. Uh, there's a Society for Prospective Medicine handbook of, of prospective tools. And this was when Track Changes was just coming out and people didn't know how to use the internet. <laughs> and it was oh, crazy. Wow. I had to teach them how to use Track Changes so I could edit their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've been there, but uh, five editions, that's admirable. We, we never got after the first edition, but... Uh, now, I'm curious uh, back in, in uh, Madison because I've known Jeff since the 70s and really sad that he checked out on us so early. Yeah. But uh, now what was, he was in family medicine, right? Um, yeah. You were like parallel organizations and uh, yeah, we were, departments. Yeah, we were in the same department. And, you know, Jeff uh, uh, is a very talented osteopathic or was a very talented osteopathic physician who had interest in myofascial health. He also did a lot of um, uh, training in, in uh, sexual health and a number of areas that uh, and just a wonderful therapy too was his, I'm sorry? Prolotherapy was his big Prolotherapy, yeah, that was another big area that he was a pioneer in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I remember when he had you and some other guys over at his house when I did my little talk, uh, were the other guys part of your department? I don't. You're the only one I remember besides Jeff. But there was a yeah. Um, I remember David Robago was there, and he's done a lot of the research on prolotherapy. He uh -huh. just went to Penn State to head up their research uh, division with his wife Alexandra. 
and I, I think maybe Adam Reinflesch was there, some other folks from our integrative medicine uh, program. And I remember that time well. How many staff did you have then? Oh, well, we started, I started with no budget, uh, a mindfulness teacher, Catherine Bonus, a massage therapist, Mike Johnson, an administrator, uh, and that was it. Uh, and, um, and we had a, an old closet in a fitness center that we changed over to a consultation uh, uh, exam room. Uh, and from there, we grew, grew to more, more than 50 folks in, I think, wow. five different uh, clinical venues in Madison. Uh, and we started a, a, a fellowship training program that has since produced a lot of leaders in the field. The first fellow was Adam Reinflesch, uh, who now uh, is the director of integrative health at the University of Wisconsin. He took over when I left. Uh -huh. And uh, he was our first fellow. And the, one of the best things I ever did was have him start the fellowship after he yeah. was the first one. And, and uh, he did a beautiful job of, of growing that. Now, um, and there's still like 50 some people there? Oh yeah, it's, it's still going strong. Uh, before I left, we got a big contract with the VA health system to oh. train uh, their clinicians in this whole health model. And uh, really that's uh, shifting from a what's wrong, you know, asking not only what's wrong with you, but what matters to you. Yeah. I messed up the metaphor. Not, we ask not what's the matter with you, but what matters to you. There, there it is. <laughs> that's a good one. I hadn't heard that. I got a, yeah, another it's not close. mine. David, um, but original it, it, or another source? Another source, yeah, not not from me. Um, uh, but the whole process was to shift the whole VA, the largest healthcare system in America, the VA health system. Yeah. To, to want to change in the conversation to what matters to you as a veteran. What do you want your health for? Similar to a military mission. What's your mission? Are you, yeah. are you willing to die for your mission? So you, you bring in emotion and motivation. Uh, what do you need to be successful? And so how do we define your team? So there's three questions that we shifted that to asking the veteran, what do you want your health for? You know, what, what gives your life meaning? Number two, where do you need to start? We had eight key areas that allowed them to choose nutrition, mind, body, spirituality, uh, uh, professional development, uh, different areas that they would choose and say, hey, I need the most help with this. And then the third question is, who do we need to recruit on your team for you to be successful? So they, in essence, created their own health team that we helped facilitate. And now the data is just coming out showing tremendous cost savings and improvement in wow. care, reduced burnout in clinicians in the VA uh, with this shift. Fantastic. And, and all those things you mentioned, the fact that you could talk about that in an allopathic medical, let alone a military medical system, yeah. made major inroads. I wow. know, the military. I mean, they're, they're leaders in this process. I love the yeah. military because when they figure out they want to do something, they do it. <laughs> <laughs> and now this sounds like a uh, much more mainstream acceptable program than Andy's with his, all of his weirdness there in Arizona. Are you like in comp competition for fellows or how does? Uh, uh, no, there's plenty. I think there's plenty to go around. It's interesting, Andy, he originally was perceived as this kind of new age, outside the box person, yeah. but he started this shift in the culture and now he's almost seen as conservative. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the culture has shifted so much that I mean, he's stayed the same. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to see how the culture has shifted around him. He was truly a pioneer in getting this started. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, have you in, encountered Lindley Smith at uh, Virginia Medical College? Uh, mm -mm. He's an old timer, uh, apparently. Uh, he had me lecture to a little class he was running in 97, 98 at uh, MCV uh, for integrative he wanted me to talk about wellness and they didn't get it. It was like 10 students and they couldn't comprehend a non-treatment paradigm. You know, my wellness paradigm is not about fixing things, but learning and growing. And, and uh, but I'm, I'm tracking him down to interview him too. And 
uh, thought maybe you'd encountered him. How many uh, uh, similar programs are there in the U.S. now? Are you just a handful? Uh, in integrative medicine? Yeah. Oh, there's there's more than 60 now. There's a consortium really? of academic health centers for integrative medicine that uh, gets together yearly. And uh, the, the rules are you need uh, support from your dean of your medical school and you need a, a program in integrative medicine. And now there's, boy, I haven't been as involved more recently, but I think there was 54 schools and now I'm sure it's more than 60, uh, which is almost half of the number of medical schools in the United States. I wonder if Tufts, my alma mater, would have gotten on board with that. I think they have, yeah. Um, yeah, my 50th anniversary is coming up soon. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you should. Or, or was yeah, it? Yeah, Andrea Gordon uh, is at Tufts and, and, uh, sh and uh, Craig Schneider's at Maine, but they're affiliated with Tufts and they have yeah. a program. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I interviewed uh, Chris Northrup the other day in Maine, and she'd done her residency at the Tufts New England Medical Center, where we crossed the street from our old clothing factory that was the medical school when I was there. They built a new one after I left. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a New England person, though. Um, so um, you've got the book. What, what, what's the talk, let's talk about your department there in New Mexico and what made the move um, to New Mexico. Yeah, well, I was uh, 16 years at Wisconsin, which was very rewarding and uh, enjoyed that. Uh, and then the dream always, uh, at least for me, professionally was to lead a department of family and community medicine. Uh, and this chair's job came up and I visited and, you know, the, the mission of our department is really to serve everyone, anybody with a pulse. So, and we do uh, really address the most underserved populations in a very poor state. And the mission just felt uh, really meaningful to me. And there was good people who were here for the right reasons. And it was, mm. you know, it was, it just, attracted me to want to come and be a part of it and so I applied and they uh, were kind enough to invite me in and I'm proud of some of the work that we're working on. So now do you have an integrative medicine component? Uh, we do. It was started long before I got here and it was born within the internal medicine department. Uh, it's oh. called the Center for Life, the UNM, University of New Mexico Center for Life. Uh, and uh, I'm supporting it uh, in any way I can, but it is administered through another department. Uh huh. Well, no doubt you've infiltrated your department with your ideas and. Yeah, yeah, we're trying. And then, you know, how do we, we're really trying to bring that whole health and healing philosophy into our primary care network. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a tremendous opportunity in the new value based uh, care models uh, that are coming out. Uh, through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid to really pay for the outcomes we want to achieve, which is value, better health, and lower cost. Uh -huh. uh, and um, so I really think that's a tremendous opportunity for integrative medicine to, to contribute uh, in this health care revolution towards learning to pay for what we want for our communities, which is healthier communities. Whereas the old model of, of the disease-based care, you really want your communities to be sicker because if disease yeah. is profitable, subconsciously you want your communities to be sicker, which is stupid. So, you know, I'm excited to be part of this conversation to figure out how do we create a payment model that sustains health and really helps us achieve what we want for our communities in which we all live. Now, what does Big Pharma think of all this? Oh, well, you know, uh, I, I used to be probably more anti-pharma than I should be. Now I'm trying to be more political and, you know, thank God for some of the new diabetes drugs we have and some of the cancer therapies, but we also can't ignore the influence that that financial impact has and how that has shaped the culture of medicine, not always for the best. Yeah. It seems to me it's, it's uh, the machine. I grew up in with a family doctor, we had a 19 bed hospital in Bluffton and there were two and a half doctors. So one was on <laughs> semi-retired and I was supposed to go back and take it, his place or, you know, take the place of the, the next doctor. But Terry Chapel wound up marrying a classmate of my sister's and he went there and 
started his celebration of health center. I don't know if you encountered Terry Chapel or not. He did the big meta analysis of uh, chelation back in the 90s that uh, showed the first positive results of chelation anyway. Uh, so uh, I know about that kind of practice and how a 10 or 15 minute slot uh, conveyor belt practice, what that does to doctor patient relationship and having the same doctor. And my dad kept his, all of his records on uh, eight by 10 cards and you yeah, generally yeah. fill a card in about five years. <laughs> right. One line per visit with what the diagnosis was, what, and he dispensed his own meds. So, uh, and then the, the last line was the charge. He was charging a dollar an office visit until he went to college and then he doubled it to pay for <laughs> college. But, uh, uh, and, the, and the quality of care probably was maybe even better. Uh, yeah, because, because he had more time he to spend with patients. Yeah, yeah, you know your patients, and my some of my medidoc friends who have uh, gone into uh, concierge medicine just to get out of the the rat race, yeah. and um, try to have that personal relationship, but that it is economically viable for a lot of folks. But I was talking to um, Governor Dick Lamb yesterday, who explored, he's been very interested in the sick care system. When I heard him talk about uh, people had a duty to die, that got my attention. I had met him when I gave a wellness presentation back in the 70s at his office, but I followed him and tracked him down. He's 83. He's saying the Swiss have the ideal situation because it's nonprofit, but they're privately run uh, systems rather than a single payer. And they actually voted down switching to single payer, but what are your thoughts on the, the whole insurance and uh, you know coverage of people? What, what do you think is the future of that? Hmm. Big question. Uh, you know, my my knee jerk response is a single payer would re reduce a lot of waste and it would yeah. create equity of services for all populations. Um, will I see that in my lifetime? Probably not. Uh, and so what you just described, I think, is the beautiful next step for America is how do we take the profit out of it? Uh, mm -hmm. because when, again, as disease becomes profitable, it makes us do things that aren't in the best interest of our yeah. patients or our communities. Uh, the challenge is that's become so profitable, uh, it's hard to turn that ship. You know, exactly. uh, Don, Don Berwick, I heard him say that we're almost at 20% of the GDP uh, for healthcare. And his question is, is our current healthcare system in America worth 20% of your paycheck? Are you, are you getting your money's worth? And I would say no. <laughs> you know, for 20% of your paycheck, you should have a free CSA delivery to your house. You should have free gym membership. You should, I mean, my gosh, the amount of waste in our system is just unbelievable. So, and uh, to call it healthcare instead of sick care is a misnomer too. Yeah, and that old saying of, you know, uh, America's health system uh, isn't healthy and it's not a system, right? <laughs> There's a lot of uh, fun uh, quotes in that in that regard. Um, but and our you know, outcomes. I'm sorry. Our outcomes are nowhere near what the other G7 countries. Oh. Have. Yeah, by by far, I haven't gotten fired for this yet because I say it all the time. By far, we have the most expensive, most harmful, least effective healthcare system on the planet. And, yeah. and, and so that's got to change or we're going to go bankrupt. We're going to bankrupt yeah. our, our country. And, and so MIPS, you know, uh, the Affordable Care Act and, and some of these value-based payment models that Medicare is trying to incorporate is a, is a good step, but it's just so complicated. Uh, particularly small town docs, they, they can't do it. They just don't have the resources or the time or the skills to uh, meet these requirements that a multi-million dollar health system does. So yeah. we have to make health simple to pay for. And, and so we need to bring in brilliant uh, financial strategists and business people to help us really learn how to pay for health. Now, are, are the graduates of your program, any of them going out into the small towns or are they all sticking in urban practices? You know, we're proud of, of being ranked number two in the country for rural health uh, training at University of New Mexico. So a lot, of, 
I'm sorry? They actually follow through and, and go and stay in small towns? Many do. Uh, and we're trying to incentivize that by giving rural doctors a tax benefit so their tax uh, mm -hmm. a, a load is much less than someone who practices in a much more populated area where they're not needed as much. Uh, and uh, we're trying to reduce their medical school debt. Uh, so we're really trying to create some financial incentives for people to go into these underserved areas. Is that a state program then or? Uh, the, the tax one is a state program. And then the loan repayment is both state and federal. Uh -huh. uh, and, and then we have the Indian Health Service here uh, where we're trying to uh, feed uh, physicians into Indian Health Service. We have a, a grant, a HRSA grant that we just wrote to start a new residency, family medicine residency in Shiprock, which is the northwestern mm -hmm. corner of New Mexico in one of the Indian Health Service hospitals, which would be the first IHS family medicine residency in the country. So, uh, and I just chaired a, a New Mexico legislative committee to double our, our number of primary care training uh, GME slots here in New Mexico in five years. So uh, we're doing a lot to invest in, in primary care. And you know, what I love is how, how do we bring this knowledge and expertise of health and healing into these clinicians' mindset as they go out into these smaller communities. What's GME? A graduate medical education. Oh, okay. Like CEUs yeah. sort of where you Yeah, getting... it's residency. Yeah, yeah. So how many residency slots do we have to train uh, family medicine docs, general internal medicine, general pediatricians? We also are including psychiatrists in that, even though they're not primary care, they're really important to address the health needs of our state, which has yeah. a lot of mental health challenges. And I'm, I was curious about Indian Health Service because I spent a summer on the San Carlos Apache Reservation over next door uh, near, um, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name of the nearest town, Perido was one of the towns and uh, uh, got to see uh, that whole system and now uh, that was 50 years ago, but uh, yeah. I'm curious what kind of flack you've gotten over the years for being uh, different. Did you get much? <laughs> I like being different. Um, you know, the first flack I got was from my father. I said, hey, Dad, I'm going to do this, this uh, fellowship in integrative medicine. And he thought I was creating career suicide. <laughs> uh, uh, which was funny. We laugh about it now because he really thought it was a, now he thinks it's a wonderful idea. Um, uh, but at the time, uh, it wasn't, and it was somewhat risky because it, it was seen as something outside of traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting. I mean, if you look at like nutrition science, at, at the time I went into my fellowship, that was considered alternative medicine. And, oh, yeah. And, and I mean, my gosh, look at how much less diabetes and heart disease we'd have if we just focused on that. And yeah. so yeah. those things that were considered outside the box really shouldn't have been. And I think part of the fun and rewarding part of my career is, is helping bring those into mainstream uh, curricula. We, one of the first grants I had was with uh, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine that gave us a grant to then fund five medical schools to bring some of this into the curricula. And they did that in very unique ways. Like uh, I think it was UMass, University of Massachusetts brought in spirituality to the cadaver lab. So they taught <laughs> medical students how to uh, explore spirituality uh, related to that cadaver that they were dissecting and, and what kind of spirit once inhabited this cadaver. I mean, so there was very unique ways to bring wow. uh, some of these things into uh, traditional medical education. And that was a fun thing to be involved with. And we did that through the American Medical Student Association, AMSA. Yeah. Now, were you, uh, besides your dad, what other kind of skepticism uh, from colleagues or... Uh... How's it been on that road? Yeah, you know, yeah, um, there were some, but not as much as you would think. And I think it's because I was good at talking the language of science. And, um, and then that helped create some trust. Because mm -hmm. you have to be passionate about what you're talking about. If, you, if you're passionate about it, people will listen no matter what you're talking about. Uh, but you have to back that up. And as, as the saying goes, you have to be credible to be incredible. And, huh. and I'm not saying I'm incredible, but at least having that degree allows you an audience to say, hey, you know, what if we thought about health this way? 
and, and allows us to bring in. And then there's always those naysayers. And, and I always would think of, and this isn't very politically correct, but I always remember a quote someone told me that if you, if you try and teach a pig to sing, you not only fail miserably, but you annoy the pig. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you pick your battles, right? You know, if someone thinks it's a bunch of hooey, fine, you have to write your opinion. I'm going to go talk to somebody else. And, yeah. and so, you know, you find the audience that is most receptive to want to change and, and spend your energy doing that instead of those that you'll never change. Well, I see you as a, a paragon of the second generation of this whole field, having known Norm Sheely and Gladys McGarry and Bill Manhan and uh, yeah. other folks like that. Uh, and actually, I interviewed uh, Everts Loomis before he died. And uh, the tape got, I think it was uh, lifted by uh, Australian Customs. And somehow it didn't get back in my suitcase, oh. which I'm very disappointed. He died six months later. But I'm curious what if any influence they had on you, and, and uh, you, you said you read Andy's book. Um, yeah. But, well, Bill uh, Manahan, I'm just going to give a shout out to him. I, I can't imagine a more kind, loving soul. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I mean, he's been a true friend and a guide and a mentor. Um, Gladys, uh, I don't know her personally, but, uh, you know, sometimes you when you're just in the presence of these people, it's transformative, and, and mm. she's one of those kind souls. Um, uh, and, you know, I put Andy Weil in that camp and, and, and so, I mean, that's been the fun part of this journey is getting to know people like you and others who just allow you to think in a different way. I, I have to tell you, Jack, after you after we talked about circumcision, it gave me a completely different understanding of how I would then do shared decision making on that procedure for for families and it really gave me a, a different perspective so thank you for that i mean so right. that's a good example of how you know just a brief touch with someone who has a different perspective than you allows you to grow thanks i didn't even remember that conversation so yeah you, that's what we meant for for was you to tell us uh, do you remember that i mean you, uh, you taught a lot about that didn't you circumcision I get into it usually. It wasn't the primary uh, goal. I, I don't even remember what uh, what Jeff brought us together for, but that was an aside that I, once I get started on that one. Uh, <laughs> and now we can talk about that one. The big one right now is vaccines, where you can't even talk about it or ask questions. You get fired and have <laughs> an interesting conversation with Chris Northrup and her partner, who is a Harvard-trained epidemiologist. and. Maine is struggling with that. Uh, and I don't know, uh, you know, given where you are, uh, what your position is on <laughs> vaccines, but uh, the, the day- Yeah, you do want to get me fired, don't you? No, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> it is true. I mean, there are some sensitive topics that, uh, yeah. and, and this is, uh, you know, I think it's a sign of our times. Um, you know, people are, 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 are nervous about getting labeled and so they don't talk about important issues we should be talking about. You know, I think racism, the Me Too movement, you know, we should be talking about these things. But, yeah. you know, once you're labeled as, as this, rightly or wrongly, I mean, it, it can really have a negative effect on your yeah. career. You know, vaccines, I, uh, I don't know if we want to go there, but, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a, I mean, it's one of the greatest inventions we've had in healthcare. And with anything, we have a tendency to maybe overuse it. And are we inhibiting the body's own immune system from getting smarter if we uh, uh, give too many immunizations that may not help it grow or adapt to a, an environment that we need it to adapt to? And early, uh, largely because of lack of breastfeeding, uh, there's a physician, uh, Cowell, just published a book. He's an uh, anthroposophic medical doc pediatrician in the, in the San Francisco area, and I just saw his book, but his awareness of the health of the, of his, the kids that he sees, the unvaccinated ones are so much healthier than the vaccinated ones. The allergies, both my granddaughters have all kinds of issues that I think were related both to their scheduled C-sections and their vaccinations, and no one's studying it because they don't want to know you know, if, if this were true, it would be so upsetting. 
uh, just like the dentists don't want to know about uh, amalgams and the uh, and the fluoride business. You know, I I, I stick my nose in all of these hot topics. <laughs> don't want to get <laughs> you fired. Is, you know, what are we doing with all this energy around our? Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot. I mean. We've become so dependent on these things. No one wants to look at the potential harms of this electromagnetic field that is big that one. Is around. Yeah, and then with five G untested coming out, they're already rolling it out in Brisbane. Um, but it makes our life so easy. I mean, yeah, that's so this exactly. It's it's a, a trade off and and hard to to deal with. Um, I'm curious, had you in, any encounters with Norm Sheely and? Um, yeah, I've, I've met, it's been a while uh, since I've talked to him, but yeah, he's truly a pioneer and innovative thinker who's done some fascinating work, uh, but it's been a number of years. Is he, He's still living, isn't he? Yep, I interviewed him a few months ago. He's gone awesome. strong. Um, awesome. And uh, did you ever encounter Paul Brenner in San Diego? He was, he was the first oh, doc I met. Uh, he was a... Uh, uh, um, gynecologic surgeon, uh, um, uh, cancer surgery, one of the first. And then he discovered acupuncture and got into all this holistic stuff in the 70s. And uh, he's in his late 80s now. And uh, uh, I've got an interview with him. Um, fascinating guy. He and Bill Manahan are a lot alike in some ways. So, um, but uh, the, um, the second generation uh, that I see you as the uh, um, shining example of, and uh, a few other folks. Uh, uh, I've just discovered that um, Helen Caldicott's daughter, I interviewed her, you know, Jeff and she were good buddies with PSR, but her daughter is president of the Australasian Integrative Medical Association oh. down in Sydney. So I've got her on the list. Oh, nice. <laughs> Plus, Boy, there's a doc down there. You're collecting. Pardon? What a great library you're collecting. Yeah, I've got 310 names now. <laughs> and you're number 50 that I've done. Awesome, wow. It's be a big project. Um, be. So between Australia and, and the States and a few in Germany, uh, I've got a lot, a lot of work cut out for me. The question is, what are we gonna do with this, you know? Yeah, uh, well, it's a nice, it's a nice library of, of recordings. Yeah, I, I think historically it may have some value down the line. But uh, um, are there any other words of wisdom and or uh, gems from uh, on your path that you'd like to share with folks down the line? Um, I, I, you know, personally, I think it's so important that we try and quantify the unquantifiable. <laughs> and I don't mean the in ones and zeros. I mean that we recognize and and feel the importance of of this subconscious, mind, body, spiritual, whatever. I don't even have a word for it, but you know there's some energy out there that we cannot explain that is very powerful. The force. And, and I think uh, when that shines between two people, healing happens. And yeah. we need to create an environment for that to happen as frequently as possible. And, and right now in our current model, it has so many barriers that yeah. it's burning people out. So how do we, how do we bring back that richness, that that liminality where two people are suspended into opportunity yeah. for them to really heal together? And and that's what's so rewarding in this work is when you allow that to unfold. It's so it's so rewarding and fulfilling. Uh, and it's not you're not alone. You're inter you're interconnected with with other living things. And you're such a, a living example of it right now. I'm I'm touched. Uh, the, the, some people call it the we space, and uh, and you're able to be, to be this way with with your staff. Like, can you connect with them? Uh, for that would be the ideal. I don't think <laughs> it's like golf. What, one of those events gets you going back, right? One good <laughs> shot. Uh, and when you've been privileged to feel it enough times, it's it's an addicting feeling. Uh -huh. uh, and you know it's there, and you have to keep reminding yourself, how can I do this? How can I reproduce this? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I did um, write a book with a co-author uh, called Compassionate, The Compassionate Connection. And it's really? all about the science of that. 
And interesting, I got to track that down. Yeah, and it was published by Norton. And uh, all the proceeds are being donated to medical education for us to learn more about this, this space and wow. how we reproduce this as we train health professionals into the future. Uh, and um, it, you know, I, you can't, you can't really define it, but we got to keep trying. <laughs> we we got to keep exploring it because I think the next frontier is we've done disease pretty well. You know, we, we've got experts in that, but we have not created a scientific model to explore health and healing. And there's a tremendous opportunity there. If we're really going to do value-based outcomes in healthcare delivery and really start to pay for what we want, we have to bring really smart people together to explore these, these mysteries uh, that facilitate health and healing. Wow, what a great uh, closing comment to uh, wrap us up, unless you have another even better one. No, that's all I got. <laughs> that's enough, man. That's fantastic. So this has been delightful. Uh, we got to stop meeting this way. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to see you again in person, Jack. Sometimes. Yeah. Soon. Well, I, I I'd love to get back down there, and uh, we we had a great time up in uh, um, the, the place where all the weird stuff happens. Taos. Uh, Taos. Yeah. Taos. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous up there. Yeah. yeah. Come visit. Okay. Well, thanks again, man. Take care. All righty. Bye bye.